My Lord Wolf Stannis, are we agreed to the terms? I believe we are. Where is your purse? He stands there. And yours? Unopposed side. I believe that as the challenged, Eltabar Benyitzik has decided to go first. That is acceptable. It's this, my great and singular pleasure to boast to you a one whose vocal breed bespeaks us of a bard beyond measure. Descended from kings, good gentles, take heed. I spied him first in the herald's dark art, enchanting with voice, enthralling all ears with humor and kindness, piercing the heart to crash such sweet dreams outlasting the years. But lest you think all is beauty and light, my ladies and lords, keep your banners furled. For this, my lord, is prepared for a fight. Martian warrior, destroyer of worlds. <laughs> and yes, your dignity gives this sidekick our Yehuda Eltabar Benyetsik. You see, my friends, I was challenged to a duel of storytelling by my good friend Bazili. And how could I refuse such a challenge? And so, today, I will tell you a tale of the time that I, Yehuda ben Yitzhak, was mistaken for a Scotsman. <laughs> now I hail from far Khazaria. Khazaria lies on the Silk Road. And therefore, it is not uncommon for caravans to travel through Khazaria, but also to originate in Khazaria for the purposes of trade. And in my youth, in my youth I chose to join one of these caravans. And we found ourselves eventually in the Italian city of Verona. Now, when one travels, one makes sure to have enough clothing because when you arrive at your destination, you still have to do business. And if you're going to do business, you need to look the part. So I thought I had packed appropriately and sufficiently, but in fact, I had had the worst luck ever along the way. And all but one of my Dalmatics had been torn or stained. And we arrived in Verona, and we sat wearily down to table at the taverna where we were going to be staying and the serving man tripped and spilled wine all over my last good dumbbell. And I thought, well, so much for this trip. It's going to be a couple of days before we make enough money that I can go and have a new dumbbell made for me here in the city. So what am I going to do in the meantime? Well, next to us, at the table next to us, there were a group of what to us were very strangely dressed individuals. They wore tunics, not unlike ours, but over these tunics, instead of Dalmatics, they wore essentially a blanket, pleated up and slung over the shoulder and pinned, and actually, to be honest, they looked very fine, I thought, but it was an odd mode of dress. Well, they noticed my distress. And now, between us, of course, we had only broken Latin as languages. I had learned a little Latin knowing that it would stand me in some good stead here and they had done the same. They were on pilgrimage, I found out later. Um, at any rate, the point is, they had a spare one of these blankets, and they were willing to lend it to me. And they proceeded to show me how to pleat it up and sling it over my shoulder, and they lent me a, a, the, the appropriate brooch. And so there I was standing, more or less attired as them, and this curious look came over their faces. They, they, like suddenly something had occurred to them, or they'd seen a ghost in me. But we didn't really have enough language between us for us to understand what the problem was. And the moment passed, and I thanked them as profusely as I could, and we went all on our merry ways. Well, two days later, I was taking a break from our business. I was strolling down a street, and I was set upon by this very angry gentleman, a young man I did not recognize for all worldly. 
I had no idea who this person was, but he was clearly very angry. He was yelling at me in what I assume was the local language, but I understood none of what he had to say to me. Now I stood my ground. I was not going to show meekness to this individual because that would certainly end poorly. But I had no idea what he was talking about, and my clear confusion, my appearance of innocence, was clearly making him all the angrier, and sure enough, he drew a knife. Well, what was I going to do? I had to defend myself. I also, therefore, drew my knife. And so we proceeded to fight. But it was a very clumsy sort of fight, because frankly, I'm not very good with a knife in a fight. And neither, it appeared, was, was he. Despite that he had started it, he did not appear to be trying to hurt me. I couldn't really figure out what this was all about at this point. Well, finally we got into a position where I kind of pushed him off and pushed him back. And he was resetting himself and getting his balance. And then his eyes go wide. And I, I have no idea why, except then I notice out of the corner of my eye, sidling up to me, I look over, because this is the oldest trick in the book, right? Look over there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but now this person is close enough to me that I can kind of see out of the corner of my eye and I realize that I am looking in a mirror. Because there, standing in a remarkably similar kilt but a different colored tunic, is someone who looks an awful lot like me. Each of us looks at the other and has a moment of clarity, because I presume that his compatriots had told him the story of how they had lent the garb to me and then had this instant, and I realized immediately why they had thought they'd seen a ghost, because clearly when we were dressed similarly, we could have been twin brothers. Well, our my assailant, his eyes go wide, and he's like, okay, there's two of them. I don't know which one I want, but I want one of them. <laughs> and so he prepares to resume the fight, and then out of the crowd comes his apparent twin brother. <laughs> so now we are in a two-on-two -two fight. And it's only going to take a couple more people joining in before this becomes a general melee, which is not what any of us want. And it remains a fairly clumsy fight, although one thing I notice is that I am not wearing a purse of any kind, but he is wearing a kind of purse slung about here. And I notice that one of them is going for the crotch on him. Now, there are a lot of reasons why you might want to injure someone in the crotch. <laughs> but this becomes important later in the story, I assure you. At any rate, finally, in the midst of all this clumsy fighting, the local constabulary arrive, break it up, and drag us off to a place of incarceration to await the pleasure of a magistrate. And naturally enough, they put the two sets of apparent twins each in their own cells. This gave this other gentleman and I an opportunity in our mutual broken Latin to fill in the gaps in what the hell was going <laughs> on. Now, it took a while, and I did not learn all of what I'm about to relate to you in that cell, but what it came down to was that this gentleman, who gave his name in Latin as Michaelis Filius Petri, or in his own language, Malvigil Magillifater, that he was here on pilgrimage, and that he, despite being here on what was ostensibly a holy purpose, had, uh, shall we say, a lay away with the ladies. And that he had been keeping company with a young woman a couple nights ago. And he presumed that at least one, if not both, of these assailants was the lady's brother or other relative come to make some claim upon honor. This seemed a reasonable enough provocation, and it explained the attack. But it didn't really help us figure out what the heck was going to happen to us, except about five minutes later, the magistrate arrives, and he simply lets us go. And now we're very confused, because we expected to at least be questioned. So we question him. We ask him in our mutual broken life, what the heck is going on? And he attempts to explain, and as nearly as we can work out, it went something like this. You see, the woman in question, in fact, uh, that was a relative who attacked me, uh, but she has no brother. It was, in fact, her sister. You see, they had this wonderful scam going on where one of them would catch the eye of a unwary traveler and thus set up a pretext for the other one to dress in male clothing and make a claim on honor on the next day. And they both deliberately dressed up as men so that if one of them needed a second, a backup, they had one. 
So in fact, there was no brother involved at all. The actual scheme was to get the person's purse's person's purse away from them. If they were caught getting the purse away from them during the fight, they would simply stop and say, well, this seems pretty heavy. For half of the gold in this purse, I'll call on our satisfied. And we'll walk away. If they did not get caught cutting the purse, they would stash it or throw it behind so that the other one between them could catch it. When the constabulary eventually arrived to break it up, the, consta the constables would receive a lovely bribe to forget the whole thing ever happened. And everyone would eventually just go about their business with the victims being somewhat the poorer, but otherwise uninjured. But since we had resulted in both of these sisters being caught with no purse with which to bribe the constables, there was no case. They simply let us go. And we are reasonably sure they let the two young ladies go as well a few days later, even though we never saw them again, because, of course, they had a lucrative relationship with them. <laughs> and we know how these things work in the real world. So, Mulvichel and I returned to our lodgings and went about our business in the city for the next couple of days, and I was finally able to have a new Dalmatic made. And that was the end of our inadvertent cases of uh, mistaken identity Although I will admit that we used the resemblance to our advantage once or twice. But that is a story for another time. And that is the story of how Yehuda met Melvichel in Verona. Thank you for those gracious words. But now I'd like you all to pay heed to the great words of Baron Krakova. Yeah. Gentles, thank you, my worthy adversary. I must say that was a most entertaining tale. Almost as entertaining as the one I'm about to share with Now, I am Vasily Boleslav Zipporkova, and I hail from Poland. And lately, I have been living here in beautiful North Shore. Um, recently, I was mistaken for a person of fine tastes in fine liqueurs. Discerning tastes, even. Now, this happened recently, March 12th, on our Anastasius uh, 53, and uh, at Coffee. We were having a beautiful night, the fourth night, as it was, of that, that beautiful war. And uh, the sky was the most amazing shade of corn farm blue. The streaks of white in it were looks as if Master Robert Ross had like taken white, titanium white, <laughs> and just streaking along. I had uh, spent the day on the Great Pier Field representing our wonderful kingdom. Northship, and uh, doing as well as I can. I'm okay with a, with a, with a rapier, fairly okay. And uh, I had uh, washed up after the after the day of battle. I had uh, put a dab of cologne behind the ears on my wrists, and I was ready for the night. Where was I going to go? Well, I was camping with their majesties, and so I had wandered off to the North Shield encampment, where I went to the Onion Dome of Baryon Bast uh, Bastion and Coquette. And they have a wonderful meeting place there. And I met my dear friend and sometime drinking companion, Lady Sibylia de Orange. Mm. I I'm sure you've all met her. She's a wonderful individual most of the time. And <laughs> she said to me, Basile, you love wine, don't you? Well, of course. Of course I do. And you, you know, you, uh, and, and you know the Swampies, right? And he went, and this non, this apparent non squeaker that I had really no idea about, went, no, I don't. Great, follow me. So she storms off in a straight line. Well, when I say straight line, what I really mean is she would 
go in a straight line. And the tents were mostly in straight lines. But then she would veer off suddenly and accost a few campers here and there. And then some of them would say hi, and others would gather up, and she would bring them with us. And at, at, after the time we'd gotten from one side of the camp to the other, there was eight or nine people with us. And I'm not exactly certain why. But when we got there, she went to a, a gentleman in the Swampies and said, do you have the bottle? And he handed her a bottle with some level of solemnity. And uh, she said to me, Basile, this is Malort. This is a fine wine made in the <coughs> mid-realm area of, um, shall we call it Chicago. And uh, it has a, in, a dedicated following of enthusiasts who drink this on a regular basis. I want you to try some of this. All right. And she takes it, takes off the cap, and takes a solid swig. Mm. Hands me the bottle. Now, the gathering around me was such that, you know, I realized there was some snickers, some, some level of anticipation, but the look in her eyes was, this is going to be a fun experience. This is going to be cool. I totally trusted her. Because she'd taken a, a shot off of that bottle, this was fine. So I took it, and I took a solid hit off of that bottle of more. Now, as many of you know, there is a front and the back of many joints. Um, the front of Malort is kind of a, a citrus medley mm. with like a, like a shot of Listerine um, <laughs> and a couple drops of Angostura bitters. You know, honestly, it wasn't that bad. But then the back hit me. How can I describe this? It was as if my tongue had been swabbed in an athletic tube sock. <laughs> and that tube sock had been worn by an eighth grader in PE for the entire semester unwashed in a rusty locker where it was then at the end of the semester taken and put into a plastic bag that was then put in the bottom of a backpack that then was hauled off back home where it was apparently lost in a child's bedroom until Sibylia to Orange had found said sock and put it around my mouth hole. <laughs> <laughs> and I made this face. I made this face. <laughs> I couldn't help myself. And the crowd uproariously blows up. They can't, they're just, they're holding it in and I... <laughs> what is that? Sibylia then informs me that the alternate name for Malort is Chicago River Water. It is <laughs> apparently a unique liqueur. <laughs> And I'm not exactly certain what set of people enthusiastically drink it, but they apparently very enthusiastically do imbibe it. Um, now, the point here was is that um, if you ever, ever have Sibylia de Orange, Mademoiselle Sibylia de Orange, ever, ever hand you a bottle of anything, anything, after she's imbibed from it first and says, here, try this. You've been warned. <laughs> As a side note to this adventure, she, I then watched her, because she has this special superpower that she can take a hit off of anything and be totally straight-faced. It's amazing. It truly is. Um, and we watched her then take in a few more souls as they heard uproarious laughter, and they were drawn <coughs> to the, uh, to this, what is this laughter? Oh, hey, have you heard of Malort? And then, then everybody goes, mm. and then it happens to another poor soul. Um, interestingly enough, that night, we actually came across one human being 
one gentleman who took a sip of that and went, that's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, we found one person that night who had the discerning, unique taste palette that I did not have when I was asked that. Thank you very much. That is my story. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Lord, I hope that this would satisfy your um, honor. You are the one who challenged me. Is your sure. honor satisfied? Well, um, well, the matter was one of great import. However, I feel that we have comported ourselves quite well today. So, in this instance... And I've learned a valuable warning <laughs> in the process, which that is worthwhile all by itself. <laughs> in this instance, I do feel that honor has been served. I also believe that honor has been served. Nevertheless, my lord, yes. I challenge you to a rematch. Yes! We will allow our seconds to work with us to find a time and place that is mutually agreeable. And we will once again regale our friends with a bardic coup. Fantastic. I look forward to it. Thank you. Good, good Master. May I borrow this for just a second? I, I do not want to upstage you. I do have a word with His Excellency Bazili, though. Okay. Oh. Good, Your Excellency. I have heard your tale of warning, and I know the lady in question. Yes. We will get to whether or not the ladies in question's honor is despoiled by your actions. Oh. But I am most concerned about one thing. You have given warning to all these people. You are, in fact, a member of my barony, correct? I am. You are one of my fencers. You are one of my fighters. You will, in fact, defend my and my lady's honor, correct? Of course. Excellent. So when Sibylla hands me a bottle of something, <laughs> I'm going to hand it to you first. Hey, I got a new championship. <laughs> 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 